Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, Lee, when you want, the floor is yours. We are already live streaming. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I hope uh, the audience is, is safe and well, and we're very pleased uh, to welcome you to our event this morning um, on uh, the new German um, renewables legislation and uh, some of the challenges uh, that and the goals of this new legislation um, that um, are of interest, of course, in Germany itself, but uh, for the wider uh, EU. Of course, Germany has always been uh, something of a beacon when it comes to um, support uh, for renewable energy. And many, many member states have in the past looked to the legislation in Germany um, to, to follow by example. Now, many European lawyers also um, look to, to Germany because it has also been a source of a great deal of case law um, in the European courts uh, with, with the last case um, almost, I think, uh, deciding that much of the support was not uh, in the form of a state aid. Um, so it will be interesting to see um, how the new reforms are received. So today uh, we have um, a very, um, very uh, skilled lineup um, to present to us um, the, the, new, the new legislation. Uh, first of all, uh, from Frontier Economics, Christopher Reichman, who has worked for many years um, in the renewable energy sector. And we will then <clears throat> turn to, to Conrad Riemer from, from Freshfields, who has also been, I think, uh, we used to call it the coal face in English uh, of, uh, of the reforms. Um, and uh, he will discuss some of the legal implications. And then we will turn to our colleagues, um, Alexandra and Matt from the European Commission, from DG Competition, who will give us um, a taste of what's to come uh, with the reform of the energy and environmental aid guidelines. So I would like to hand the floor to, to Christoph, um, who will present um, a review and overview of um, the new legislation. Thank you. Christoph, can you hear us? Yes. You're still on mute. Ah, here he comes. Thank you, Lee for the kind introduction. Um, and indeed, I want to start by setting out the background to uh, the new energy or renewable energy law, talk a bit about the innovations, and then also talk a bit about um, the way ahead. Indeed, uh, there's been a lot of attention paid to the developments in Germany. And indeed, um, the number of participants today in the webinar are a good indication of this interest. It's great to see many familiar names among the participants. So I'd also like to welcome you here from my virtual Cologne office. So the way I want to um, talk through uh, the topics today is give a brief overview where we stand, introduce you to the news in the EEG 2021 and talk briefly about what could happen next. So where are we coming from in Germany? Um, as many, many countries in Germany, we started out, as you see on the left, with feed-in tariffs. Over time, we made a number of innovations. We introduced optional direct marketing of renewables in 2009, um, then introduced an incentive, a, a management bonus for market participants to directly market their green electricity. We introduced a, a market premium rather than feed-in tariffs as standards in 2014. And then starting from 2015, we started with auctions to identify uh, the support levels, at least for larger units. And then uh, we introduced uh, auctions as a standard from 2017. And we're now in the next phase of innovation. So let's have a brief look at um, where we've come from. One interesting observation is obviously how um, prices paid to renewables have evolved. Uh, in this graph, we show the evolution of um, the 
auction prices that have resulted. And as you can see over time from April 2015, these have come down from a level of, um, of around nine euro cents to a level today in the order of um, five euro cents with a whole sequence of auctions. Um, the auctions that you see in this slide here, they represent the photovoltaic auctions. Um, also, just looking at uh, the, the 2020 um, auctions, it's quite interesting to observe and compare on the one hand, the photovoltaic auctions on the left, the onshore auction in, in the middle, and then the mixed auction on the right hand side. Um, the, the whisker bars indicate the range of successful bids that were submitted and the blue dots in this graph indicate um, the forward price of electricity. So these are the base load contracts without any subsidies. And the first thing we observe is that in the PV auction, actually the, the prices that we get here, they're, they're pretty close already to um, the general wholesale price level. It's quite different for the onshore auctions. And we also observe that in the blended auction, the units that actually won uh, were practically all uh, photovoltaic auctions. So in, in the head-to-head -head competition between photovoltaic and wind, the, um, the photovoltaic units won. It's also quite interesting to observe how the direct marketing of renewable electricity evolved. Um, so a lot of the producers of this renewable electricity um, who directly market, they do not do it themselves. They go through service companies. And there are now a number of established service companies that have grown in size in the market. Um, and in this graph, we see how these individual companies have grown. In the next slide, we see the focus of these different service providers um, with a red bar indicating those service providers focused more on uh, marketing wind energy and those with the light blue bars focusing more on solar energy. Uh, and as you see, Practically all of them um, offer a blend of services to, to wind and solar, although um, some are more focused on solar, others are more focused on wind. The other interesting observation is that uh, among these uh, service companies, there are a number of established players like Stadtkraft Markets, Vattenfall, um, for example, or, or E.ON Deutschland. But at the same time, um, almost every second one is, is really a newcomer to the market. Uh, you could say startup companies that offer direct marketing and flexibility services. So the market's actually evolved um, quite well, but nonetheless, um, with the EEG 2021, we've introduced a number of innovations. I'll flag these very briefly and really leave it to Konrad Riemer from Freshfields to talk us to the detail of the innovation. So one important point is that for the first time uh, in legislation in Germany, we're introducing um, greenhouse gas neutrality as a target by 2050. In addition, we're introducing um, capacity targets for renewables to 2030 and also uh, renewable production target. You, you might question well, whether we need so many targets in, in parallel, but you see a clear political commitment. Um, also a clear political commitment to a continuation and extension of the use of tenders. Um, a stronger use in future of so-called innovation tenders, um, where um, you tender not for a flexible uh, premium in the market, but for a fixed premium in the market, um, which is an approach which sits better with um, risk hedging, risk management in some organizations. Um, we'll continue with the market premium. The way market premiums will be determined will evolve. And from 2023, 20, um, um, market participants will not be able to switch as easily in and out of um, the, the market premium model. Quite importantly, there's a bit of a tightening in, in relation to whether premia are paid in periods when the electricity wholesale price is negative. The initial in 
uh, intent was um, to exclude feed and premiums for any hours in which uh, electricity wholesale prices would be negative. This has been softened uh, significantly based on various uh, interventions by stakeholders. So the future rule will now be that if there are four consecutive hours with negative prices, then no um, feed in premium will be paid. Also, interestingly, and I'll allude on, on that in a moment, uh, there's also a commitment to explore the possibility of phasing out subsidies entirely. And the government is committed to preparing a plan for what this might look like by 2023. Seven. So the plan is to be provided by 2027. Uh, doesn't mean that the phase out will happen in 2027. Moreover, um, there will be certain incentives to steer where exactly renewable units will locate. So some of the auction quotas will be reserved for units to be built in the south of Germany. And also there will be increased requirements uh, to improve the ability to steer or to control the output from units with um, a, a mandatory obligation to install smart meters on uh, units above 25 kilowatts. And beyond that, there are a number of measures to enhance the acceptance of renewable support in the wider population. Uh, one measure is that local authorities will be able to participate in the revenues or in the profits of new units, um, although this might actually have the economic effect of introducing a, a local renewable tax, so we'll need to wait and see what the implications of that are, and also uh, a gradual move to budget financing of renewables, whereas currently effectively the renewable subsidies come entirely from um, electricity and network users. So these are the, the main innovations. Um, and in the last few um, minutes, I just want to dare a, a brief outlook of what the market might look like going forward and what could come next, especially if we envisage a situation where subsidies are phased out. And the complication here is, and, and I guess this is something that will particularly uh, interest the competition experts from the Commission, that we will have a coexistence of subsidized and unsubsidized units. So even today, we have the coexistence of subsidized renewables and non-subsidized conventional generation. In future, um, we expect to be in a situation where we have subsidized renewables competing with non-subsidized renewables. So first of all, there, there will be certain units which still receive funding, and, and they are shown at the top of this slide. And at the same time, there will be certain units that will no longer be subsidized, either because um, the duration of the subsidy scheme has ended, or because these uh, units come in at a time when no subsidies are paid, or they come in because the investors um, do not apply for subsidies and uh, they just develop a commercial undertaking. So uh, this could lead to a situation with the coexistence of, of various uh, types of units, ones supported under feed-in tariffs, ones um, that benefit from own consumption bonus, ones that benefit from market premium. Um, and then units that fall out of the subsidy scheme, either um, the support from the TSO, um, the, the benefits from own production or um, from the direct marketing model, and then various units that are either, uh, that are not subsidized at all, um, which serve own consumption or ones which are, for example, contracted under long-term power purchase agreements or units that support a, a larger uh, retail portfolio. So um, certainly important to watch that this competition will happen on a level playing field. Now, what could be the business model of these units which no longer receive 
subsidy support. Well, even though they might not receive subsidy support, they would still benefit from various other policy measures, as we're tr trying, trying to uh, explain in this illustration. What this illustration shows, if you like, is the value chain of renewable generation at the top to the supply of energy, including renewable energy, to end consumers at the bottom. In between, we'll have intermediaries, including the companies that I've shown on the previous slide. And anyone who produces and sells renewable energy will benefit from the electricity wholesale price. This electricity wholesale price will in part be driven by CO2 prices and the EU ETS. So thereby, um, you already have some policy influence on, um, on the attractiveness of any renewable project. There may be the possibility in addition to sell guarantees of origin. So whatever the regime around guarantees of origin is, is going to be quite important um, for this unsupported renewable. And when it then comes to selling this energy to end users, it will obviously be important uh, that the service covers the flexibility needs of um, the customers. So what we will need is a, a combination of renewable generation with the provision of various um, flexibility services. And those could come from batteries, um, from storage hydro. They could come um, from links between the power and the gas sector, um, for example, through electrolysis. Um, they could come from um, biosources and, and so on and, and so forth. So some of the value of selling this renewable energy and adapting its profile to the needs of customers will come um, from the addition of flexibility services and how these flexibility services are valued and priced will depend on uh, the balancing energy regime, the rules regarding power interruptions in extreme situations and so on. And, and so you see in this graph that um, policy in the policy framework, which is indicated through the red boxes will still have an important role to play in this overall setup. And a, a key role for the intermediaries will then be to ensure uh, what is known as, as the term transformation between long-term renewable investments and downstream contracts, which are much shorter term in nature, where these individuals will need to bear some of the commercial risks of contracting renewables more long term and then selling the output and marketing the output more short term. So this is a, a feasible model. And indeed, it is a model that some companies uh, are already uh, developing and building up. Um, now, the final question is, is then obviously, is there really scope for such renewables to compete in, uh, in a market without subsidies. And what we've tried to depict in this illustration here is to show certain, in this case, um, public domain projections of electricity wholesale prices. So these are the um, dark blue and, uh, and the beige curves and contrasting them to various projections of where the costs of photovoltaics and wind may stand. Um, we're showing this on the one hand for Germany for various years, and also uh, we're showing it for the, for the Mediterranean region. And our expectation is that there is a window um, in, in Germany in future um, around 2030 and beyond um, for renewables to become viable, even without explicit support. Although it's worth noting that there may be um, more attractive locations in Europe where to build and locate renewables and they might be more around uh, the Mediterranean. So even though we think that there is scope um, for unsupported renewables in Germany, uh, we also need to think about the best locations around Europe. And we also need to think about a regime which ensures the integration of renewables across different borders. So to conclude, um, we think there's been interesting experience with renewable support in Germany so far, especially the direct marketing and, and the use of auctions. There are some 
interesting innovations in the new EEG, although we would have hoped for some of those innovations to be slightly more ambitious that we are. And finally, as an outlook, we see an opportunity for a gradual phase out of subsidy re regimes. And we see an opportunity uh, in, in the medium term future for renewable projects to come on stream, even if they're not explicitly subsidized. So this concludes my brief presentation and I hand back to Lee. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. That was an extremely stimulating presentation. Lots of issues. Uh, there are questions coming through, but if you don't mind, I'll, I'll keep the questions um, till the end um, so that uh, everyone uh, will have a chance, I hope, to, to pose questions. Uh, let's move now um, to, to Conrad Riemer from uh, Freshfields. Conrad is a principal associate at Freshfields and will take us through some of the goals and issues of the new legislation. Conrad, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Lee. And thanks very much for having me and for, of course, uh, your interest in the topic, which is, I think, uh, quite interesting and quite relevant beside Corona. Um, uh, thanks very much, uh, Christoph, uh, for for this very good overview. I will focus somewhat more on the on the legislative details, and given the short time frame, I suggest that I just jump directly into the agenda. So, first of all, I want to explain um, um, the main goal of the EEG 2021, which is, of course, capacity expansion. Um, I will then turn to the main issues, which are, of course, space, where to build all these um, renewable facilities, acceptance, what do the people in Germany think and um, how um, can it be granted that people accept all these um, uh, building of new uh, renewable um, capacity and, of course, network stability. And last, if we should have some time left, um, um, I will go on and um, have some words on the support of hydrogen production. So let's turn to the first point, capacity expansion. Um, yeah, the main goal of the EEG 2021 is of course a significant increase of the renewable capacity. Christoph already touched upon the, um, the overarching climate goals. There is the 2050 goal, which is emission neutrality by 2050 for all electricity, not only generated, but also consumed in Germany, which essentially means that um, imports of electricity to Germany also needs to uh, meet the emission goals. Um, um, which, is, which is quite important. Um, then the 2030 goal, which is also, um, in my opinion, very ambitious, 65% of all electricity consumption must stem from renewable electricity generation already uh, in 2030, which is uh, in nine years. Um, what does this mean? So um, what did the EEG 2021 um, um, do? The legislator um, translated this capacity goals into a capacity and a production expansion tracks. Chris have already touched upon this uh, topic. And uh, within the capacity expansion track, the legislator distinguishes between the different technologies you see on the, on the left-hand side, wind onshore, wind offshore, solar and biomass. And in the middle, you see um, the target for uh, 2030. So the overall target of wind onshore, 71 gigawatt and so on. And on the um, um, right hand side, um, I have added or included some figures uh, um, which show what this would mean. So we need a enormous capacity expansion. So for wind onshore, um, we would need to construct within the next nine years, 34 gigawatt. Uh, even more so for, for solar, you can see um, um, cap um, capacity addition of 50 gigawatt, which is, um, in, in my opinion, quite a lot. It's, it's, it's quite a lot. Just to give you an example. So if we assume that the average capacity of a conventional, um, of conventional power plant, let's say lignite or nuclear, is between one gigawatt and two gigawatt, let's assume it's 1.5 gigawatt, you can imagine that... Um, the capacity expansion is, is, is it's, it's an enormous amount. You need to construct, I don't know, something um, between 30, 40 new, you, you would need to construct 30 or 40 new conventional power plants to achieve this um, capacity expansion goal. Um, 
Then there is the um, production expansion track. Um, Christoph mentioned that we have uh, this, this capacity expansion track and production expansion track um, 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 belief. So um, the capacity of uh, the production expansion track um, foresees that in 2029, 376 terawatt hours um, must stem from renewable production. This is also um, an, an enormous amount, just to give a comparison, in 2018, only 210 terawatt hours um, were produced uh, renewable in Germany. This slide just gives you a short um, impression of where the focus of uh, the capacity expansion lies. So in the years 2020 to 2023 and 2024, um, the capacity ex expansion is um, rather moderate um, compared to the capacity expansion expected for 2025 and 2029. This is a, a graph taken from the um, official um, um, reasoning of the, of the new legislation. Now the question arises, how to achieve these expansion targets? Um, and the legislator, of course, assumes that more market premium to more beneficiaries um, is a way to achieve these um, targets. Um, just to give you an impression how the system works, if you don't know it. So the market premium, this is the premium which is paid to um, the beneficiaries, follows from the applicable value, which is an anlegbare Wert in German, minus the average monthly market value or for newer um, and power plants, the average yearly market value. And the beneficiaries and the applicable value um, is determined or established by tenders which are held by the federal network agency. And the EEG 2021 now significantly increases these tender volumes. So the legislative thinks that an increase of tender volumes, of course, leads to an increase of beneficiaries. It has to be noted, though, that uh, the increased tender volumes remain below the required capacity expansion track. So the track I just uh, outlined uh, one slide ago. And this is due to the fact that, um, that the legislator assumes that um, in the near or middle future, um, there will be um, an increased um, yeah, a build up of uh, renewable um, capacities without a specific remuneration. So let's see whether this is realistic, but um, at least this is what um, the legislator assumes. A question, what is um, if the projected capacity expansion is not sufficient to achieve the very ambitious climate goals? Um, the legislator introduced uh, a monitoring process and, um, um, and um, a, a, a means to adapt the capacity goals. So the legislator um, initiated um, or introduced a, co a cooperation committee, which consists of state secretaries. And these state secretaries oversee the progress uh, of the capacity expansion. And should the committee realize that the expansion is too slow for meeting the goals, um, then the federal gov government may adapt the capacity and the production targets and even the tender volumes and the maximum bits in the federal network agency's tenders uh, by decree uh, without involvement, uh, involvement of the legislator. You might consider this a uh, Maybe not a trick, but um, it's of course much easier to to adapt the capacity targets and production targets without having to involve the two chambers of um, of the German legislature, so the Bundestag and the Bundestag. So, and there is quite some flexibility in the new um, legislation to to really react to um, to um, um, difficulties in the future. Of course, one very relevant question is um, who pays for the capacity increase? So first of all, the legislator keeps the EEG surcharge mechanism. Um, you might have heard of this. And so the network operators pay the market premium and for smaller um, um, renewable power plants, the feed-in tariffs to the renewable facility operator and then passes on the cost to the end consumer. This is the EEG surcharge and this is one of the reasons why electricity is quite expensive in Germany. But obviously the legislator um, was a bit worried that the EEG surcharge might um, increase too much by um, this um, capacity expansion. And the legislator then decided to directly subsidize um, uh, the mechanism from the federal budget. So um, the legislator um, um, wants to yeah, to, to provide 11 billion euro from the recovery package and the revenues from the newly introduced CO2 pricing system um, um, shall also be provided to um, the EEG mechanism. 
And of course, the question arises, what about uh, state aid? Uh, due to the payments from the state resources, the applicability of the new provisions is subject to state adherence by the European Commission. Okay, let's turn to the main issues, which are, um, if you want to have it in a nutshell, um, the main issues are space, acceptance, and network stability. And I will just touch upon some, some of the new um, uh, main regulations and how to address these, um, um, these difficulties. So let's turn to wind onshore. Uh, one problem Christoph already mentioned, um, so the main restraint to, to further expansion of wind onshore um, was in the past the lack of acceptance. Um, the municipalities often use the planning law to prevent the construction of new windmills because um, the muni municipalities um, used the law in, uh, and said, well, uh, there is no space anymore uh, on our ground for, for new windmills. And the solution now is that the windmill operator can offer the municipality some kind of um, financial benefit, uh, benefit which is 0 0.2 cent per kilowatt hour if the municipality is really affected by the windmill and then the windmill operator can pass on the costs into the system uh, which means he can pass on the incurring costs to the network operator which then in turn passes on the costs to the network users and the end consumers which might, might be someone like a second um, EEG surcharge hopefully not as expensive. Next problem um, um, and this touches more upon the, 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 the issue of network stability. So one problem in the past was and probably still will be um, in the future, wind energy is predominantly produced in Northern Germany because there is more wind in Northern Germany. Whereas the ele electricity is predominantly consumed in South and West Germany. So in the, in the industry focal points in, in Germany. And due to the lack of transmission cap capacity from North to South, there is of course an increasing risk of network congestions if wind onshore facilities are mostly constructed in northern Germany. What is the solution now the, the EEG 2021 uh, suggested? Uh, suggests the EEG introduces south quotas. Christoph touched upon the topic. And in the tender process of the uh, Federal Network Agency, 15% and as of 2024, 20% 20 of the tendered volume uh, shall be awarded to wind onshore projects in south Germany so that we have a, um, um, a faster ramp up of um, wind onshore in uh, South Germany, and the, only the residual amount is then awarded to um, facilities in uh, the whole country. Let's turn to um, solar. Um, one problem in the past was that the construction of solar facilities on buildings, so on rooftops, uh, was and still is, of course, more expensive than the construction of solar facilities in open space. And um, in the past, um, this led to the result that solar facilities on buildings were not competitive in the um, solar auctions um, uh, held by the Federal Network Agency. And the solution the EEG 2021 foresees is the introduction of different auction segments for solar facilities on buildings, on rooftops on the one hand, and in open space on the other hand. So that competition uh, takes place only within um, different tenders, so only with uh, um, competition only within um, um, solar facilities with a, uh, with a similar cost structure. Another issue was, um, or still is, uh, where to build all the solar facilities, so question of space. Um, uh, under the EEG 2017, a stripe of 110 meters alongside the German autobahns and the railways could be used as space for solar facility. And the EEG 2021 thought that this idea in principle is a good idea and now extends this stripe to 200 meters. And consequently, there should be more space for construction of solar facilities. Um, Honestly, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know whether this is really an, um, a concept which is which will bring the the, um, the effect uh, the legislator hopes for. Because if you drive along the German autobahns, it's not the case that you have uh, solar facilities all along the autobahn. So maybe this will be the case in ten years, but um, let's wait and see. Um, then there is uh, the concept of landlord to tenant electricity supply, which is called a Mieterstrom in, in German. So just to explain you the concept uh, very briefly, uh, the landlord may claim remuneration for provision of electricity to its tenants if the electricity is not fed into the network. If the landlord fed, uh, feeds it into the network, he can, of course, uh, claim the EEG um, a market premium. So the concept is, um, in a nutshell, um, uh, the landlord provides electricity to, um, to, to tenants, uh, which is produced on the roof. 
and provides it directly to the tenants living in the house below. And in 2019, the remuneration was about one cent per kilowatt hour and um, um, an expert committee found that, um, that this amount is too low to give an incentive to the landlord to really construct uh, solar facilities on the rooftops. And now the solution is just yeah, more money. Um, so a significant increase of the remuneration um, by the EEG 2021. I think, or I hope at least I have some minutes left to just give you a very short um, impression of um, how the legislator plans to support um, the production of hydrogen. So you, you may be uh, aware of the EU Commission's hydrogen strategy, but there is also um, a German national hydrogen uh, strategy, which was uh, published, I think, in, in, in early summer last year. And uh, both strategies aim at supporting the ramp up of hydrogen production. One problem, especially with regard to, um, to Germany, is, of course, that uh, the electrolysis requires a high amount of electricity input, but electricity is, is quite expensive in Germany, inter alia, of course, due to the rather high EEG surcharge. So currently, a large-scale production of hydrogen would only be feasible if the electro um, electrolysis uh, would be privileged under um, uh, the EEG regime. And this is now the solution of the EEG 2021. The, the, the new legislation provides for two instruments. Um, I can just switch onto the next slide and um, there you can see it a bit better. So the first instrument is a limitation of the EEG surcharge to 15% uh, of the regular surcharge. And um, this limitation in principle applies to both gray and green hydrogen. However, the government can restrict um, by a degree a uh, de 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 decree um, privilege to green hydrogen. So we will have to, to wait and see um, what um, uh, this government or the next government will, will do in that regard. Uh, the second mechanism is a limitation of the EEG surcharge even to 0% of the regular surcharge, but this is only applicable to uh, green hydrogen and is only um, applicable if the, govern uh, the government uh, issues uh, a decree that that specifies um, the criteria that, um, that uh, uh, green hydrogen has to meet. And another uh, requirement is that the electrolysis plant must be taken into operation before 2030. And of course, um, all these provisions are only applicable after state clearance by the EU Commission. I think my time is up. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Conrad. Um, that was indeed a quick top uh, tour through some of the, the the goals and and the issues. And I think we see um, some familiar instruments like reduction of surcharges um, still very much firmly um, in the in the armory um, of uh, support. So I'm sure we'll come back to uh, some of these issues too. Let me move on uh, quickly. Um, to Alexandra Saler and um, Matt Fikowski from DigiCop, who will um, take us through some of the main points that are being um, discussed um, in the preparation for the revision of the state aid guidelines. Um, Matt and Alexandra, the floor or the screen is, is now for you. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I hope I'm unmuted and uh, everyone can see the presentation. It seems so. So uh, yes, uh, good uh, morning, everyone. And uh, thank you very much for, uh, for having us. Uh, we are here uh, with uh, Matt Wietzkowski and myself, Alexandra Seller. We both work for the European Commission's uh, Directorate General for Competition. And uh, more specifically in the unit that deals with the state aid control for uh, energy and environmental protection. And this uh, obviously is uh, the unit that also looks at renewable support schemes. So here comes the link to the, to the topic of today with the, with the AEG 2021 uh, reform. So what we will talk about today is the, the big picture and the future of renewable support, which is uh, the revision of the, of the guidelines for state aid for environment and energy. I will come uh, to it in a moment. It is very imminent uh, within this year and uh, also what uh, this uh, will mean for uh, renewable support in the future in general. So I will start off with uh, the content and uh, the general state of play of uh, the revision. And then my colleague Matt will make a more focused intervention 
uh, in the following on what all of this then might mean for renewables uh, more concretely. And we present here today as a disclaimer to say we present today uh, the state of play today and uh, our personal views, of course, uh, the, the outcome of the revision uh, can, uh, cannot be uh, prejudged at this point. So to start with a little bit of context on, on stated in, in our sector, uh, the relevant guidelines, they came into force in 2014 and they originally were set to expire by the end of last year, but it was decided to prolong them by one year. So until the end of 2021 for uh, two reasons, first of all, to have a very thorough evaluation on how they have worked. And secondly, to really have the significant stakeholder involvement that is necessary when you revise rules that are so uh, pertinent at the, at the current juncture. The evaluation was uh, carried out uh, in the so-called uh, fitness check. And it has overall been quite uh, encouraging in that it has shown that the rules facilitate uh, more effective and less distortive deployment of state resources uh, uh, in the sector uh, than uh, previously but that they also start to show limitations after having been in force for six or, uh, or seven years. Then there are also two uh, additional developments that have really taken the challenge of the revision beyond the limitations that were identified in the fitness check. And here I'm obviously talking about uh, the European Green Deal and about uh, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic and uh, the recovery ambitions and the policies to lead to recovery from, from this situation. The European Green Deal uh, obviously will require new and very, very important investments to spur the transformation of the energy sector, the industrial sector, etc., that is needed to come to climate neutrality and circularity. And so all communication related to the Green Deal indeed makes a mention of the importance of state aid and usually refers also directly and specifically to the guidelines for environmental protection and, uh, and energy and uh, calls for their, uh, for their revision. As regards to the recovery from the, from the COVID-19 pandemic, this basically reinforces again uh, the need to revise the, great uh, the guidelines as uh, the Green Deal is a very, very important component of, of the recovery strategy. And uh, one example, uh, the recovery and resilience plans, for example, have uh, half of the flagships that are related to energy and uh, environmental protection. So on the procedure in which uh, I hope that uh, many of the participants in today's seminar uh, have already been involved or will get involved with uh, shortly. I've already mentioned the evaluation in the form of the fitness check. That was finalized in October of last year and the results have been published. So they are really for everyone to, to consult and we very much uh, encourage this. Uh, then in the actual revision that is coming, going into its uh, hot phase uh, now, uh, we are looking for significant involvement of uh, stakeholders. There has been an open public consultation on an inception impact assessment, which is a short document that outlines our, our initial ideas for the, for the revision and routes that it could go, and also on, on a very specific questionnaire, which closed now in, in early January. But uh, if you missed that, uh, there will be more consultation. And in particular, there will be an eight week consultation on actual first draft text of the new guidelines in the course of the spring 2021. So uh, look out for that. And there's also a related but separate debate on how EU competition policy in general, so all instruments, not only state aid, but also mergers and uh, antitrust uh, can best support the Green Deal. This was announced by the Executive Vice President Vestager in, in the end of September. And uh, there will be a conference on this in early February uh, 2021. And then, as I already said, uh, the uh, target date uh, to adopt the revised guidelines is uh, the end of uh, 2021. So let's dive a bit uh, in, in, in the substance. And uh, not sure how familiar of the participants are with the, with the details of the, of the current guidelines. So just to say that uh, they are quite uh, prescriptive and they regulate the use of 14 different policy instruments. So this is support for renewables, support for combined heat and power, uh, et cetera. 
uh, this uh, is quite rigid. And what we are looking for is to widen the scope of the guidelines and reorganize the structure in a way to have rules that go around the broader policy objectives. So really to look at, uh, for example, things, environmental protection, everything that supports environmental protection, security of supply. And then of course, there is the, uh, the whole block of uh, energy intensive users and surcharges that was already alluded to in, in previous presentations. Uh, what we hope to achieve with such an approach is to really broaden eligibility and make room for all potential contributors to the objectives of the Green Deal, which uh, is very important at the, at the current juncture, and also to ensure uh, or have a better chance to stand up to future developments in an environment that uh, has been very dynamic in the recent past, uh, also is dynamic at the moment and uh, probably for the, for the foreseeable future. However, when you go to this increased ambition and scope, uh, you also want to flank it with uh, improved, very well-designed safeguards to avoid uh, undue distortions of competition and trade. In short and stated, what we mean is really to direct the aid where it is needed and to the extent that it is needed. We really want to pull together public and private funds and make aid measures uh, very cost-effective. So to maximize uh, the impact that they have, and uh, also uh, maintain the, the public acceptance. Again, I think these uh, are two points that uh, have been uh, mentioned in the previous two, two presentations and fit in here uh, quite nicely also uh, for the revision of the AG 2021. Now to go a bit more concrete, what we mean when we talk about uh, safeguards that we are considering, the first one is transparency. So the question, to what extent member states should identify the contribution to environmental protection in their support measures. For example, if you think about decarbonization, that could take the form of euro per ton of CO2 abated and uh, make this transparent, uh, public, visible, and also to do so in a harmonized manner so that things become more comparable. The hope is that with that, there's more visibility and possibility to quickly evaluate uh, how a measure actually uh, contributes to the targeted objective in the environment and, uh, and energy arena. A second point is tendering, so competitive uh, bidding procedures. This uh, has already been applied under the, under the current uh, rules for renewables, but also, for example, for cogeneration. And also the evaluation has yielded the, the result or confirmed the, the impression that this has been uh, quite uh, successful. Uh, and uh, here we are looking into other areas to which uh, this could potentially be uh, extended uh, with uh, the aim to again, limiting the aid to, to, to what is really needed. Uh, the next point is broadening. This is related to tendering in a way, but uh, still separate. So we really want to emphasize it also on its uh, own merits. So it's the question of how wide schemes have to be. And also, and there we come to the tendering, how wide tenders need to be. So what should be in, in one tender? What should be required to be in one tender? And here in particular, when you think wider, when you also think about uh, things like industrial decarbonization, you ask yourself questions, should there be broadening to other directly competing firms, to various related industrial sectors, or even other areas where, again, thinking about decarbonization, CO2 emissions uh, could, be, could be reduced. The aim of all this obviously being uh, to, to put the aid, uh, first of all, uh, where it is needed, and then also to directly target potential competition and, and trade distortions by allowing competitive competing entities also an equal access to receive the support and one step further we're also looking into into cross-border opening this of course has also been a subject in the past uh, when when guidelines were devised in this area uh, with the with the objective to address even further even more directly the deep pocket distortions with that we mean that member states quite clearly have a different means they have different industrial priorities, different priorities in the energy sector. And also now they have been very differently affected by the, by the COVID-19 crisis. 
and uh, this uh, should uh, could uh, hopefully uh, limit potential competition distortions uh, even further. There's one additional point that we do not have on the slide, but that I want to mention at least quickly. And this is the form of the aid. And we have heard about the, the AG 221, which is paid out in the form of operating aid. In the revision of the guidelines, we look at various forms of aid operating, but also investment to see where distinctions still need to be made and where rules can be aligned because the whole uh, complex at the moment is very complex. And we will also look, uh, in particular for people who are more uh, familiar with the investment aid, into the, the various concepts like aid intensities or full funding gap, uh, looking at cash flows, and to see uh, where to draw the balance uh, between uh, simplicity and proportionality. And I want to uh, finalize with uh, one comment uh, on, the, on the general uh, context. And their uh, support schemes are, of course, not only dependent on, uh, on state aid rules and uh, our guidelines, but also on the, on the relevant uh, sectoral legislation. For example, here talking about renewable schemes, uh, they are very much influenced by the rules in the Renewable Energy Directive and the Electricity Regulation, for example. And these are, of course, also uh, legislative acts that are under close uh, revision and review as part of the of the Green Deal package. And here, I would like to thank you from my side for your attention. And I had to hand over to, uh, to Matt, who will now uh, try to give a bit of a personal view, a flavor of how these points on substance uh, could uh, translate uh, in particular to schemes uh, for uh, renewable support. Thanks a lot, Alexandra. And, uh, and thank you to Lee for inviting us. So indeed, yeah, I'll give a, what has to be considered a personal view on some of the uh, the ways in which the things we're exploring here could uh, could relate to renewables in particular. And so, I mean, I think in general for the renewables section of the guidelines, the fitness check showed that overall the rules are quite well developed here compared to some of the other areas. And so it's not necessarily an area in which we'd see uh, major changes. Um, but but that said, we need to see what, what um, uh, we need to, we're continuing to analyze the responses to the consultation that closed on the 7th of January. And so we haven't yet done that. So let, we'll have to see if that, um, that changes things. And there are still some changes which could be, could be quite important in this area. So one thing that Alexandra has mentioned in, in terms of transparency in, in the slide here is this possibility of looking at quantifying the environmental benefit of uh, proposed projects to receive aid. And in my view, this is relevant for renewables just as much as for new areas of decarbonisation. Um, so it's, we, have, we have renewables targets, so it's clear that there will continue to be a need for state aid to ensure those targets can be met, those are European targets. But it's also true that it, if you, I mean, if you think of the first, uh, if you have a, a fossil fuel based electricity system and you add your first unit of renewable energy, uh, say a wind, wind farm, it's fairly clear that that will give you a, a, a positive environmental benefit whenever it's windy, because that wind will generate and displace fossil fuels from running. But it becomes less clear once you're adding, I don't know, the 60th gigawatt, say, of, of wind to a system. And there you, you can start to see that actually renewables is curtailed sometimes and not necessarily displacing um, less, uh, uh, more polluting forms of electricity. So here you can, you can and, and, and so different renewables might have a different contribution to decarbonisation. And that contribution might depend on the time in which they're installed and the way the electricity mix as a whole evolves. That also, of course, rem uh, it depends on demand. I mean, if you keep increasing demand at times when it's windy, you can keep on adding wind and, and still have an environmental benefit potentially. So look, that's that's a kind of an ambition, but we uh, we would absolutely recognise that that is very challenging to do because of all because of those dynamic aspects and the fact that it it's not a, a simple calculation that's fixed in time. But that's something we're looking at. Could we do that for renewables, and if so, how? Uh, and indeed, could could we and should we oblige member states to do that when they're uh, proposing to spend significant amounts of state aid on on renewables in future? The, the next thing I wanted to say something on is this idea about broadening, where we see, uh, I think when the guidelines were introduced, the current ones in 2014, it was clear that the, the kind of big new thing was very wide scale support for renewable electricity. And so the rules are very much focused on that. There's a lot of attention on that in the, in the 2014 guidelines. Uh, 
what we see now looking forward is the potential for a, a lot of aid in new areas uh, related to sector coupling. So the electrification of, of heat and transport and the electrification of, of for example, um, uh, low carbon gas production. So hydrogen is obviously a big area with a, with a new strategy just, just uh, introduced. So this idea of broadening is looking at whether um, the, the new state aid rules can make it easier where member states want to, to have wider and more inclusive schemes, uh, which, which seems to us a potential area of interest to reduce competition distortions from schemes. But that said, I think we, we recognize that there would still be a need for member states to specifically support renewables because there are targets for that, same for energy efficiency. And same for, you know, there's a hydrogen strategy, so probably a need to have specific support for hydrogen. But what we want to do is make it at least possible where member states want to, to, uh, to design um, schemes that cover more than one different approach that delivers uh, the same kind of environmental protection in the end. Um, and, and, and that just, we're looking at whether to the extent to which it's possible to have similar rules for these different categories of things. So that if a member state says, yes, I want to include three or four of these approaches, the rules are similar, so it's easy to, to do that and use them in a sort of modular way to build up a, a broader scheme. Whereas at the moment, you, you, you have some sometimes quite um, difficult to uh, explain differences in the approach in the rules, uh, depending on the technology, which I think we just want to reevaluate and make sure that if differences like that remain, then they make sense. I, don't, I wanted also to, there's two more things I wanted to mention. The first of those two is, is integration and you know, this idea of renewables integration. Uh, and what rules might change in that respect. I mean, the, the rule on negative prices on and whether aid should be allowed at times of negative prices in, in 2014 is in my view, the right one. I mean, it is a quite, it's, it's a strict rule. I think my view is also that the interpretation of that rule has been too generous. So I am interested personally in seeing whether we can have a stricter uh, kind of use that use the new guidelines to establish again, a stricter rule in relation to paying for production at times when the market says that this product is, is you know, is, uh, is worth a negative price, is a waste product. Um, I, I'm also interested in seeing whether there's a possibility to internalize more costs into market prices. I mean, one of the things we, we, we also look at schemes for security of electricity supply and the new sectoral legislation there, the electricity regulation 2019, requires member states that are introducing a capacity mechanism for security of supply to to identify market and regulatory failures and make a reform plan to address uh, regulatory failures as a, as a precondition for introducing support in that area. And there, there are some possible areas in, that might, in, in, in which that might also be relevant for renewables. I mean, for example, when you start talking about locational uh, specific support for renewables to address grid issues, is there a possibility to internalize more of the, the costs um, and those uh, the, the costs and benefits of the right locational choices into market prices to support to, to support renewables integration and to support the, the development of projects in the right places. I mean, if, for example, renewables is more exposed to curtailment risks, could that help incentivize both locational choices and a, and a diversification of different renewables technologies that complement each other rather than everyone investing in, in, in wind or in solar? Uh, and we're also looking at whether the framework is right in terms of the form of the aid. So some are calling us to look again at, at having a stricter, stricter rules requiring investment aid for renewables and not using a contract for difference. On the other hand, many people are asking for significant new flexibility to use contracts for difference, not only for renewables, but also for a wide range of technologies. And no doubt you've, you've heard some of the discussion about the potential for carbon contracts for difference to be used to, uh, to, to support a variety of potential project types. So yeah, we're looking at the form of aid and whether what, what rules we should put in on that. And then, and then finally, just to come back on cross-border opening. So this is, I think we, we don't underestimate the, the challenges here of doing something on this, but it's another area where we, when we look at the security of supply area, it's been a success in terms of competition to open up capacity mechanisms across border. And that's now reflected in the sectoral legislation. And there are clear, I mean, that there is nothing else that we have on the table as a, as a particularly useful tool to address this deep pocket distortions point that, that Alexandra mentioned. So this possibility of, of cross-border opening remains on the table, but um, let's, let's be clear that that's, that's certainly uh, a very challenging area uh, to, to be able to make any proposals. So, so we'll see. So thanks very much. That's the, the, the kind of personal reflection I wanted to add to try and give a bit more of a flavor on 
where we're thinking specifically in terms of renewables. Um, uh, that's the end of our session. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed. Um, that was uh, um, a very, ex a really excellent session from both uh, both of you. We, uh, I think, all benefited very much from these um, insights into the ongoing revision exercise. Um, and I see there being there are questions coming through. Um, we also have some some questions from the panel from each. Yeah, the panelists have proposed questions to each other, but I think. Um, start with questions from the audience um, and uh, there is there has been one question um, on the role of nuclear in the EEG reforms um, is is that considered um, I'm sort of rephrasing it slightly um, but uh, is it considered renewable um, presumably um, nuclear will only be imported into Germany um, in the in the near future um, so perhaps uh, Conrad would maybe first like to reflect on that question. So I think at least from a, from a German perspective, nuclear wouldn't be considered uh, renewable because uh, we have the phase out of nuclear power plants. And um, I think this, this will still be valid in the next few years. So from a German perspective, I don't think that this would be really considered as, uh, as renewable. Christoph, any comments on, on the impact of, of the nuclear phase out for the ambitions um, in the EAG? Um, yes, it's, it's a very interesting question and um, also one that, that Dominic um, <laughs> um, asked um, in, in relation to earlier. Um, and in, indeed, what one of the key drivers of, of why we think um, renewables have have uh, a future in Germany, Northwest Europe, even without explicit renewable support in future, is that the markets in Germany, Northwest Europe will tend to be short of capacity as a result of nuclear phase out and of coal phase out and compensation measures by the German um, government to uh, still sustain uh, the CO2 price in the market. Um, so as, as a result of the renewable um, phase out will, will uh, sorry, the nuclear phase out will have two effects. One is uh, less capacity available, which increases the price of electricity. And this will be in support of new capacity and that new capacity um, very likely involves renewable. So that is one aspect. And the other aspect is that even though nuclear is, uh, is not considered a renewable capacity as Conrad has just outlined, it is still a, a low carbon technology. And if you phase it out, you have to substitute that low carbon technology by a, another low carbon technology. And again, those are most likely renewables. So even though there, there's no, if you like, direct or formal link between nuclear phase out and renewables, indirectly th there is via the energy price and also via the CO2 price. And, and both of these channels, they will lend support to renewable investment. Thank maybe I can. Sorry, sorry, Lee, to speak over you. Uh, maybe I could just compliment just to just to make sure there's um, not a misunderstanding in the question as well. I, I think probably not, but just to be sure. So, it, it, whatever the German targets are domestically, of course, the, the the import and export of electricity is is closely regulated in European rules, and and you couldn't prevent or reduce nuclear nuclear electricity imports, uh, as far as I can see, without contravening the European rules for electricity trading. Indeed, thank you. That uh, <laughs> reminds us all that we live still in a world of free movement. Uh, the Brits amongst us tend to forget that sometimes um, when we see our ham sandwiches being held up uh, by red tape at the borders. Um, and of course, nuclear um, has never been classified as a renewable in the EEAG. Uh, I don't know if that will be reopened um, in, the, in the revision, but uh, Maybe you don't want to reflect on that just yet. These are maybe old chestnuts that uh, come up every time. Um, there's another old chestnut question uh, from Vincent Perauden uh, on the bidding zone issue. 
in Germany um, and the question of whether or not uh, Germany will ever embrace a single bidding zone. He's asked that question uh, to both speakers uh, from, sorry, the first two speakers, I should say. So, um, Conrad, is that something you feel like you'd like to comment on? I think I would leave the floor to Christoph. Okay. <laughs> Christoph. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, to comment. And, and indeed, um, the, the single German bidding zone is, as we know, is, is politically a, a very contentious area. We know that the um, maintaining the, the German bidding zone has, um, for example, led to the expulsion of Austria from the German um, bidding zone to, to be able to, to manage um, congestion that occurs effectively within the German system. There, there's obviously a dispute and a court case uh, 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 around this, but uh, it, it is a big issue in, in Germany. So, so politically, it, it's a big issue to maintain a, a single bidding zone, but we obviously know that in terms of managing the system, it's creating various issues, um, which are supposed to be overcome by um, grid investment, which will would allow sustaining a, a single bidding zone in Germany. Um, although we know that there have been delays in the expansion of the north-south connections in Germany. And we also know that by the time that we do have these new connections, um, we will need further connections um, if we follow this buildup of renewables as um, Konrad has outlined a, a moment ago. There is a relatively weak signal in the EEG to um, locate some of the new renewables in the south of Germany. And we don't think that that will either be sufficient or targeted enough uh, to take the pressure off um, congestion between the north and the south of Germany. So therefore, I would expect the question of a, a single or two separate bidding zones for Germany to remain on the agenda for the foreseeable future and certainly for the next decade or so. Thank you. I think also, of course, um, uh, with respect to um, the alignment with, with the electricity regulation, there is, of course, an obligation on member states to uh, conduct regular bidding zone reviews and uh, to eventually, I suppose, um, deal with these problems by, I think it's the end of 2025. Um, so we'll see if that actually happens in Germany. Um, I'd like to ask a question um, to uh, Matt and Alexandra on behalf of Nick uh, Bitsios. Um, he would, um, he asks if there could be a little bit more information provided on how capacity remuneration mechanisms could be examined um, in the revision. Uh, I don't know if you, you're happy to take that question or if this is something that's a bit um, uh, sensitive at the moment, but perhaps you could give a, an outline of the commission's thinking in this respect, given the importance of these mechanisms. Thank you. Sure, so again, you can have some very much personal views from me. Uh, the this is another area I'd say where the rules are quite well developed. So they're, all, they're quite pro-competitive in a way at the moment because they, the, the, the approach is basically you identify the, the objective, you quantify it and you put into a competitive process all the different uh, potential uh, capacity providers, including those from across, broad, across borders uh, and now following you know, a new, newly developed methodology from, from uh, ACER and SOE uh, in relation to various aspects. So the rules, the rules are quite well developed. I think there's some areas where we are interested to see if we can be a bit more specific. I mean, I suppose one of, one of those is, well, maybe two worth mentioning. One is where there are measures that are, are for security of supply, but not necessarily these, these capacity mechanisms that support generation. So you can have demand response measures and interruptibility schemes that can be important measures that involve state aid and cause potentially quite important competition distortions, but which, um, which, we, which we, could, we could maybe do more to clarify the rules for in the, in the new guidelines. Uh, and then the same goes for measures that are not a general capacity mechanism, but are, are interventions to encourage investment to uh, respond to a locational problem. Which, yeah, Germany, Germany obviously has, has some measures like that. Um, and so that, that's another area where we might be able to clarify the rules. 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, now, um, we have a very complicated uh, or detailed question from uh, Clement Ziegler, uh, which I will try to summarize. I think this might be a question for, for Conrad. I don't know if I, Conrad's had a chance to read the question on the chat. No, <laughs> he's shaking his head. Um, maybe I can summarize it um, as best I can, as, as it is rather long and detailed. But I think that the essence of the question is um, that there appears to be um, so an amnesty built into the new system um, related to the EEG surcharge. And um, the amnesty um, will, I think, amount to um, the um, electricity suppliers getting a settlement uh, prior to uh, June 2022, um, under which they are released to have to pay any re arrears to their TSO, uh, but they will still have to pay the full EEG surcharge this year. Uh, this amnesty means that possible opportunities to further reduce costs for electricity consumers will be lost as the arrears payments would have led to lower future EEG surcharges. And the question then um, is to what extent is the impact of this mitigated by the federal budget subsidy to the EEG surcharge um, that becomes available for the first time in 2021. So I, I hope Clemens, I've summarized your question um, accurately and I don't know if Conrad would prefer to answer that via um, a direct response or if he'd like to say something about it um, briefly now, or if Christoph would like to mention uh, his reflections on that question. Conrad. So uh, I think I've, I've not thought this through, but um, I, I know where the question is coming from. So it, it concerns the question of, um, whether you're privileged if you um, self-supply. So if you're an industry company, for example, and, um, and self-supply um, or operate a um, power plant for yourself, um, then the question arose in the past whether you're privileged under the EEG because you don't participate in the, in the EEG system. And so um, you were considered under former versions of the EEG um, um, free of the EEG surcharge. And there was some, um, some dispute on um, how far this privilege reaches. And um, in, in former versions of the EEG, so the EEG 2014 and then the EEG 2017, there were some rules. So these, these amnesty rules um, where the legislator tried to clarify um, to what extent you could benefit from this self-supply privilege. And um, as there are um, disputes ongoing, and of course, this is a, a, a very high risk for, for um, companies who potentially had to pay back or had to pay the EEG surcharge, though so we, we are talking about millions of euro, um, the legislator now tried to, um, to implement some kind of um, um, claim for, um, for settlement. And... Um, I would need to think that through whether this is really relevant under the um, under the state ed rules. But um, so maybe that's for me at least. It would be a bit premature to 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 respond uh, to this question really really deeply. So um, maybe I could give you some some background to the question, but um, I would leave the answer um, um, open so far. Okay, thank you very much. I think perhaps you can continue with a direct chat on this, um, as it seems to be extremely complicated. Um, moving on, um, we have um, a question um, from um, Francois Bird um, on the cross-border elements. Um, I think this might well be Conrad again. <laughs> uh, you're in the in the in the in the hot seat today, um, but uh, Christoph has also mentioned it, so we can come back back to him. And of course, um, both Matt and Alexandra have commented on how complex the issue of the cross-border elements um, are likely to be. And so the question is, um, to what extent are the, is cross-border production dealt with um, in the new EAG? Um, do the rules, um, do the, the rules apply for renewables um, only supplied um, in Germany or produced in Germany? 
but would statistically, but which would statistically contribute to renewable targets elsewhere in other member states. That's the first bit. And do the rules apply for renewables produced outside Germany, uh, but which statistically contribute to the renew renewable target in Germany? Okay. <laughs> So maybe I can take the, the, the second uh, question first, and, and I don't know whether, whether Christoph has, has something to comment on the first question. So um, indeed, um, um, if I have it read correctly in the new uh, legislation, um, there are some mechanisms. So the Federal Network Agency does not only um, um, hold tenders for um, renewable facilities within Germany, but to a The small portion you can also contribute from outside Germany in the tenders and uh, can receive remuneration. So uh, this is some, some cross-border elements. So if you, I don't know, operate um, a power plant or a renewable facility in the Netherlands, you could participate in the tenders and by doing so, um, um, yeah, receive remuneration from um, from the EG, EG, EG surcharge. So this is one cross-border element. Um, um, maybe that, that as a first point to the, to, the, to the second question. And maybe it will be interesting to um, discuss whether offshore wind facilities in the mid in, that are in shared uh, economic uh, areas might uh, be cross-border or not. That will be interesting in the future. Is that something the Commission is thinking about, that when we have these major offshore wind parks, to, who do they belong to when it comes to this... Um, statistical accreditation. Yeah, I understand there's a lot of work going on in DG Energy to, to, to uh, iron out rules for that. Okay, thank you. And going back to Christoph, did you have any comment uh, in, on the, the cross-border elements? Yeah, m maybe just just a few additional observations, um, and, and probably it's it's worth um, distinguishing here. On, on the one hand, uh, let's say the, the political intent of the German government, and and then how this may practically be handled and, and implemented. Um, and it's it's quite interesting that there, there's a, a distinctive wording between the targets for um, for 2030 and 2050. So for 2050, it's quite clear that this is about either um, the, the production or the consumption of, of energy and, and the source of either the production or the consumption. Um, the 2030 target is slightly more restrictive and, and it only refers um, to, to the production. So I think when, when um, the law mentions either the production or the consumption, it, it obviously means that the production could be anywhere as, as long as you can uh, build some sort of a link between the production and the consumption um, in, in Germany. So this seems to me to be quite open um, to um, cross-border fulfillment. Uh, it, it seems to be less clear in relation to the, the 2030 Uh, target, which more explicitly speaks um, about production, but but possibly doesn't entirely um, rule out that some of that production may be abroad. Uh, I think that the challenging practical question is, how would you prove that um, you have actually um, produced the electricity? electricity in a renewable way when it's not been produced domestically. And, and I think the, the only way to get there is, is really through some scheme, certification scheme, um, guarantees of origin. Um, for this to work, um, this obviously needs to be a, a scheme that, that market participants rely on. And as I put in my slides, a, a scheme that you can um, you can actually monetize and, and where the renewableness of, of energy actually obtains um, a, a positive commercial value in the market, in, in which instance uh, this becomes workable. How this would work in practice, I think, is, is left open, but I, I think the law currently is, is vague enough to allow for a number of solutions, including ones which include cross-border trade. Thank you very much. And of course, we have the targets um, in the clean energy package for cross-border um, participation in, uh, in, in the auctions, uh, although they're still soft targets. Um, uh, I think a best endeavors, um, but there will, they will be reviewed, I believe, uh, 2023. Um, 
Moving to the next question, um, which um, concerns aid schemes for biomethane across the EU, um, that these have uh, never been harmonized and the interplay between these schemes has not yet been considered um, in the course of the Commission's decisional practice. Um, uh, there's a concern uh, from Gabor Son Soncoli um, that there could be um, overcompensation and price distortions. Um, and I think this question is directed uh, to, to Matt and Alexandra, but again, um, I welcome comments from, uh, from Christoph and Conrad. Um, how do we deal with this on a cross-border basis? I think that might pick up on the, on the observations on the certificates, uh, sorry, guarantees of origin and uh, verification, but uh, I leave that to Matt and Alexandra to first uh, reflect upon. Yeah, yeah. If you want, I can say uh, a couple a couple of words about the biomethane. I'm not sure whether whether Conrad or Christoph mentioned it in their presentations, but that's also an aspect of the EEG 2021 that Germany has newly introduced a separate uh, tender for for biomethane besides the tenders for. Uh, for biomass, I guess this is where the question uh, originates in the in the context of uh, of this panel. So indeed, there is uh, support for biomethane in a number of EU member states. There's also a number of stated decisions. It's true also that the aid can be given at uh, at different. Uh, stages of the production cycle. So it can be for the direct production of the biomethane or for the production of electricity from the biomethane. In general, of course, uh, biomethane is considered a renewable source and therefore uh, the, uh, the uh, compliance with stated rules is uh, ensured in the same way as for, uh, for other support schemes uh, uh, within our, our decisional practice and, uh, and uh, our procedures, and of course, uh, this is very much targeted to look at, at overcompensation, competition distortions. In general, when talking about the, the revision of the guidelines, of course, again, this being part of renewables is very much uh, one of the of the renewable sources for which uh, the points that uh, Matt and myself set out on cross border uh, apply, and uh, are certainly an, an interesting reflection and something we, we look we are looking for input for at the moment, but also all the caveats and the, the potential problems with, with such uh, uh, going further on, on cross-border uh, apply uh, to, to biomethane as well. I don't know whether Conrad and Christoph want to say something more on biomethane in particular now in the, in the context of the EEG 2021. Well, well, maybe I, I can just add um, one point that, um, which you've just said, um, and I, I rather like to widen the question even of, of Gabor. So I think Gabor's question related to um, in, in inequality or distortions um, regarding the support to biomethane between different countries. I think um, with the emergence of um, various bridges between the electricity and, and the gas sector. It's, it's not just about distortions within the gas sector or distortions uh, within the electricity sector. It is also ab about uh, possible distortions or avo avoiding those distortions between the electricity and, and the gas sector. And uh, Konrad has already um, pointed out uh, one aspect in, in relation to the German regime, um, where um, obviously the, the support, the implicit support granted to, to biomethane or, or other gas technologies is, is not just a, a, about giving the output of that technology uh, some support, but also um, exempting the input, i.e. electricity, uh, however it may be produced, uh, exempting that electricity from certain levies which it might need to pay. Um, so I think the, the important point here is that um, when we and, and when the Commission thinks about the update of the EG, EAG, it, it's not just about uh, distortions within each of the sectors. It's, it's also about making sure that we don't have distortions between the sectors. And, and this could easily become very complicated, especially if we trade some of the fuels, gas or electricity across border, um, which makes it more hard to trace what the origin is and what the composition of, of that commodity is. 
Thank you very much. I think this gets um, to the heart of the issue of, of broadening that um, Alexandra and Matt uh, raised in their presentation. This is going to be, I think, very challenging with sector coupling um, going forward. Um, I'm afraid uh, we're running out of time. Um, this has been, I think, a fascinating uh, debate. I hope that the participants have enjoyed it as much as, as I have, and I also hope the speakers have enjoyed um, the, the uh, very uh, provocative and uh, questions that we've had. Um, it's, it, I, yeah, I think it's uh, raised many issues that we could go on discussing this uh, for some hours. And uh, I think the best thing I can say is, well, there's certainly enough food for a, a follow-up. Um, and of course, um, as the um, revisions um, to the guidelines uh, at European level are rolled out, I think we will have scope for um, further debate and, and discussion. And we would uh, like to welcome you back to the Florence School uh, for future webinars on, on this subject. Um, I'd just like to mention, there was a question from Kirsty McDougall on um, how the Commission will look at the new EEG. Uh, that was a big question, Kirsty, and I think it's uh, very difficult to give a, a quick answer to that, um, but I'm sure we'll, we'll find out uh, soon uh, when the Commission um, takes its position on uh, the new legislation. But I hope um, that the presentations today have, have raised um, some really interesting um, challenges um, that, uh, we can see this is what the, the revised guidelines will also have to uh, deal with going forward. So obviously uh, Germany is very progressive in this area, but it's it's not the only member state that has um, uh, ambitious targets. Uh, from my side, uh, we didn't hear too much on the demand side. So that's perhaps something also for um, a future, future discussion. Um, but um, as the, the clock is striking noon uh, here in, in Europe, then um, I'm afraid I have to close down this session. Um, I remind you that it um, has been recorded and um, you can uh, watch it all again uh, on YouTube. Um, so I'd like to thank the speakers um, for their excellent presentations. Um, I'd particularly um, like to thank Matt for his personal reflections. I think it's always difficult to, to come out with um, those types of reflections uh, uh, when you're in an official position, but it really helps, I think, to give a lot of flavor to, to what's going on. Um, but um, also um, our colleagues in Florence, um, who have put together uh, the webinar and uh, the organization for today's event. Um, thank you also. So um, I leave you uh, and wish you um, an excellent uh, afternoon and thank you all again.